Okay. All right, just to double check, can you all hear me? Thumbs up? All right, excellent, excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It is really my distinct pleasure to launch the Net Zero World Initiative. This is the Department of Energy's signature contribution to President Biden's Build Back Better World program. I don't have to tell any of you that the summer that we've just been through with all of these extreme climate events has been catastrophic for so many. It is a hair on fire moment for the planet. And so the opportunity, in addition to the crisis, the opportunity has never been clearer. By the end of this decade, it is projected that the market for products that reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally will be $23 trillion. $23 trillion for the products that will reduce and impact climate change. Therefore, the more countries that jump into this market, the bigger that market is going to grow. And that's why when President Biden says that when he hears the word climate change, he thinks of jobs. And that's why we're committed to working with countries everywhere as they move from ambition to action. All too many nations have urgent development needs and aging infrastructure, and many have few options for alternatives to unabated coal gener energy generation. So Net Zero World is going to change that. Through this initiative, we will help to craft the technical roadmaps to reach ambitious climate goals in partner countries. And you're going to hear from some of those partner countries momentarily. We want to have the, meet their energy needs and we want to meet their climate ambitions. And our partners are going to have the ability to access unbelievable expertise uh, and assets, not just by the Department of Energy and our 17 national laboratories, and not just sister agencies like the State Department or USAID, US Trade and Development Agency and the Development Finance Corporation, all of that, plus universities and think tanks and businesses and philanthropies, including Breakthrough Energy, represented here by managing uh, Director Jonah Goldman, right? Bezos Earth Fund, that is represented here by President and CEO Andrew Steer. The Global Energy Alliance for People and the Planet, represented by Rockefeller Foundation President Raj Shah. And Lynn and Mark Benioff, thank you all for supporting this. Thank you all for helping to move the ball on addressing climate change, particularly in countries that we can partner with. And I just want to pause for a moment to acknowledge uh, the director of Argonne National Lab, Paul Kearns. Where are you, Paul? Right, who I'm glad to see here today and thrilled to have as part of our Net Zero World team. And I'm going to be bringing up one of his colleagues uh, from the National Labs in just a moment, uh, from the Net Zero World. To jumpstart this initiative, DOE and our collaborators have committed 18 million in initial seed capital with much more to come. The U.S. Trade and Development Agency and the Development Finance Corporation in particular are making sure their, their uh, associated spending also pairs and supports net zero world commitments. And that money is going to support our partner countries as they design the specific strategies that they need to decarbonize their economy. And these strategies are then going to be informed by the technologies that we know are ready to go and the breakthroughs that the Department of Energy and our labs are accelerating at home in the United States. Since January 20th, since the start of this administration, the Department of Energy has announced over $2.4 billion in funding for a diverse range of decarbonization technologies. And with President Biden's full Build Back Better agenda, the United States is going to be making an historic investment of nearly $800 billion more on clean energy and climate action through the next 10 years. 
Those investments are going to help us widen the pathways of our partner nations that they can take to reach their ambitious goals, including net zero by 2050. So we've set a specific set of goals uh, for net zero world to hold ourselves accountable. By 2022, we want to have set net zero plans and roadmaps in action and execute quick wins. By 2023, we want to implement key policies and programs based upon those roadmaps. By 2024, we want to mobilize at least $10 billion in clean energy infrastructure and project investment in these countries. And by 2025, we want to see new high quality jobs going to a diverse range of workers, 50% women, 40% within disadvantaged communities. So I'm thrilled to share the stage today with some of the clean energy leaders who are going to work with us to meet these goals, including representatives um, in front here from our first uh, five partner nations in net zero world, uh, Indonesia, Nigeria, Egypt, Ukraine uh, are all represented here, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, Argentina and Chile could not join us here. We're still excited to have them as well among our first founding partners. All uh, six of the nations who are in this first wave can see that the potential for that $23 trillion clean energy market, whether it is in solar or wind or storage or geothermal or hydropower or nuclear, carbon capture, carbon removal, clean hydrogen, you name it, all of them ready to attract new businesses, create millions of jobs, and of course keep energy bills affordable for the citizens. We all recognize that as the world emerges from this global health and economic crisis, there's never been a, a better time to invest in that clean energy market through Net Zero World. We'll work together to develop the best strategies for investment possible. I want to thank my fellow ministers for joining us today and for sharing their plans. And I will get to you all up here in just a moment. Before we do, I want to ask um, my colleague, Martin Keller. Martin Keller is to join me on stage here. Martin Keller is the director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. Martin first joined NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, or actually he, he joined the laboratory system, because we have 17 of them, in 2006, at that point at Oak Ridge National Lab, um, which is another lab that will be working on this effort. And since 2015, he's been the head of NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, where his, where his brilliance and his energy and his knowledge of the private sector have contributed to a game-changing series of scientific outcomes that have real-world applications. Let me just say, L NREL's LA, that's Los Angeles 100 study. Los Angeles had a goal of getting to 100% clean electricity and NREL developed a tool for them to reach that goal. That expertise, that tool, is now available for our partner countries. So it took, you know, it, it took the kinks that were being worked out in Los Angeles and now it's ready to be deployed. So we're very excited about that. Martin uh, has been the inspiration really for this uh, net zero world uh, effort. And I'd like to introduce him and have you say a few words, Martin. So Madam Secretary, thank you so much. It's, it's a great honor to, to kick this off in the name of all the 17 national laboratories. So I have only four minutes, so I just want to give you a high-level overview of what this really is, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of follow-up questions. So if you bring up the first slide, please. So, waiting for the slides. <laughs> okay, go to the next slide, please. So what is this? What is the mission of the Net Zero World? And this will partner with countries to help them implement climate ambitions pledges and accelerate global transition to net zero, resilient and inclusive energy systems. So what we will offer these countries who participate there is immediate and sustained access to expert technical deployment and investment assistance, financial support for in-country technical institutions, deep collab... So we find with the slides, so but go back to the second one, deep collaboration with deployment and technical and investment plans and support. 
Yeah, and you saw this already, what, what our secretary said, and we all who know our secretary, she has this urgency built in into her DNA. When you look at the goals, by 2024, we have these very ambitious goals, as she said, to at least have 10 billion clean energy infrastructure, create jobs, and really help to accelerate the energy transition in these countries. Go to the next slide, please. So why is this so unique? Because this is where you bring the U.S. Department into the United States government together with the national lab systems and our philanthropic partners. This makes this so unique in our view. And we will have key energy sectors we were touching on, as you can see here, from building industry, transport, power and energy storage, carbon capture, agriculture and energy systems. So there will be a lot of collaborative action areas in analysis and roadmaps, RD and D, uh, piloting, testing and incubators, policies and regulations, deployment and investment programs, and of course, workforce development. And the next slide shows you again the map of all the 17 US national laboratories. So they are pristine uh, kind of incubators of new technologies. We have all the tools to help all of you countries to accelerate the energy transition. And then I want to finish in the next slide that this is really an energy systems wide approach. So it's not focusing on only one component. It is the energy systems, the approach to do this holistically in all these areas to do deployment of technical investment plans for holistic energy transitions, to net zero energy systems and support for design and implementation of integrated energy systems measures. And as you can see on this slide, again, what I said, we're touching transportation, industry, buildings, carbon capture, and geological storage, storage as a whole, and of course, power. So we are very excited. And go to the next slide, please. I know there might be a lot of questions. So we have representative here already, what you said, from Argonne, from Oak Ridge, Ron Benioff, who you see is in the middle, our contact person here at Enroll. Please reach out to us if you have more questions. We are happy to be here to really help you. And let's do this together. Let's accelerate these plans. Thank you so much. Back to you, Secretary. Great. Great. All right. Perfect. Um, I also want to, oops. I, it's a real privilege to be able to introduce, uh, to say a few words, John Kerry, who is both a, a friend and a colleague and is one of the people I brainstormed with on this net zero world as we were contemplating how we could bring the expertise of the labs with partner countries who wanted to be able to achieve their climate ambitions. Um, you know, shortly after President Biden announced his Build Back Better world here in the UK at the June G7 meeting, um, John Kerry and I kibitzed over lunch on how we were going to get the Department of Energy and the expertise involved. And he's always been, as you know, just this huge champion for our planet, from his work in the Senate to his time as Secretary of State, and now as the Special Climate Envoy uh, for the President. I am so elated that he and his team have been working with us on this and even contributing to the funds to make this a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Kerry. Jennifer, thank you. Ah, thank you very, very much. Um, I want to thank our, our country partners. I can't feel like you're hearing me, but I guess you are. All right. I want you to know, I've been to a lot of cops, but I've never watched a whole bunch of people in the audience with flashing blue ears. You guys are, it's a whole new experience. Um, Indonesia, Nigeria, Argentina, Egypt, and Ukraine. We're very grateful to the partnership that we're forming with you, and I want to personally, uh, especially, say thank you for the philanthropic participation here, without which this just can't happen. Uh, and that means Andrew Steer from the Bezos Earth Fund, uh, Jonah Goldman from Breakthrough Energy, Raj Shah, with whom I was just at another event, uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation, and Mark Benioff, who I keep seeing everywhere here and who is helping everywhere. And we're grateful to all of you. Particularly, I want to say thank you to Jennifer Granholm, who's a spectacular Secretary of Energy, who has more energy than most people I know, and, uh, 
Her leadership of the Department of Energy is absolutely critical to us being able to get where we need to go. You all understand that. It is true that we were having lunch at the Energy Department, where I have to tell you I was totally jealous of the quality of their crab cakes. And uh, it was over that crab cake that I came to the conclusion that we better save these things. Uh, Jennifer and I were brainstorming, and we just came to the conclusion that, uh, that the science is not yet there, that it's great to talk about what we've got to do. We need storage, long-term storage. We need, uh, you know, we need direct air capture. We need carbon utilization. I mean, run the list. Some of these things are nascent with respect to the technology development, but not ready to bring to scale. And then others, we're just not there yet. But Jennifer and I are both absolutely convinced, as I think are all the participants here, that when we humans, and I don't mean this chauvinistically, but certainly in certain countries when we apply ourselves to the task we get the job done. Look at what happened with vaccines. Look at what happened with the internet. Look at what happened in going to the moon. We can have a rover on Mars and direct it from Earth, but today we can't send electrons from one side of the country to another. We're living in this total world of contradiction. And Jennifer and I are convinced that this initiative is born out of the notion that a net zero world can only happen if we push the curve of scientific discovery. That's what's going to happen here. Harnessing the capabilities of our, of our government uh, and these extraordinary national laboratories that we have. There, I'm not going to be bashful <coughs> by being chauvinistic. <coughs> our national laboratories are a jewel. They're a treasure. And they do extraordinary things and they will do extraordinary things. So I am convinced that we need to develop that as fast as we can because countries all around the world have told us again and again that they want to transition to clean energy. They're desperate not to just repeat the mistakes. They know it's mistakes, but for many of them they think and believe, and in some cases it is, the only choice they have until we come in and supplant that and show them, particularly hand to hand, if you will, how they can make this transition, make it pay, do it with the least pain and the greatest amount of justice in the transition. So this is a great coalition. DOE, State Department, USAID, the TDA, DFC, the, the, Dem the uh, Development Finance Corporation, harnessing expertise from 17 different laboratories. And it also addresses some of the toughest challenges that we face right now with respect to decarbonization, including the hardest sectors where we haven't paid enough attention to date in industry, steel, you know, sustainable aviation fuel, aluminum. Uh, cement is already making amazing progress. Volvo has already made a decision about a percentage of green steel they'll buy, and it is increasingly now going to be available. So we're moving. But this commitment is going to put it on a higher level of capacity, on a much more accelerated scale. And if and when uh, the president's uh, proposals pass, uh, we are genuinely off and running. Our goal, I'll end very quickly, our goal is not set by politics. It's not set by ideology. And it's not the result of any political party in our country or individual to President Biden. Our goal was set years ago when Jim Hansen started to speak and when we put together in Rio the UN framework process, when we did Paris, and now when we come to Glasgow knowing we are behind in the effort to do what the world needs us and wants us to do but we're not incapable of still doing it. If we put this effort together, put our energy and, and, and our hearts and minds to this effort, 
our entrepreneurial innovative skill is going to find ways to do things we can't even imagine today. I am a veteran of those years of the great space race. I remember when John Kennedy stood up and said we will go to the moon, and not because it is easy, but because it is hard, right? Well, this may be hard, but we're going to get this done. And I am convinced we're going to get this done the way we're working with Prime Minister Modi. We've already shown him what our labs are saying. We've already worked with him on the 450 gigawatts. That 450 gigawatts, if we achieve that, means that India will be compliant with keeping 1.5 degrees alive. If we don't reduce enough in this next 10 years, we can not only not keep 1.5 degrees alive, we can't achieve net zero by 2050. So my friends, the charge is clear. This is the way we can get there. It's a great program. And I have the best partner in the world with Jennifer Granholm. Thank you very much. Okay. So now, thank you so much um, to John Kerry. And I really am excited about hearing from you all. I've asked them to come up since we don't have enough mics at the seat. So what I'm going to ask you each to do is to come up and for you have a couple of minutes to answer two questions because we want to pick your brains and get the best nuggets. And the questions are, first of all, what opportunities do you as philanthropists see in this or philanthropists and funders? Uh, Jake, I'm looking at you. Um, uh, what opportunities do you see in this clean energy transition? And what is the biggest opportunity we're currently missing out on? Uh, when it comes to international cooperation, perhaps, uh, on clean energy. So let me do this. I'll start with Jonah Goldman. He's the Managing Director of Breakthrough Energy. Jonah, you want to come up and uh, say a word up here. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Wow, this is weird. With the, weird? Yeah, yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> weird. Yeah, I'm going to do my best. So weird. Um, so first of all, I, I'll, I'll have to say when we got when I got the first email that asked whether or not we could partner on this, it was the easiest one of the easiest grants that we've ever had to make, because when we started Breakthrough Energy, it was with the idea that the only way that we're going to be able to do this job of solving climate change is to make sure that the technologies that are the foundation of our entire modern lifestyle are affordable to the whole world in a way that then doesn't con contribute to climate change. And we're nowhere near there. There's great optimism that we have at Breakthrough Energy that the innovative spirit, certainly the innovative spirit re reflective in our national laboratories, reflective in our partnerships with DOE across a number of different issues, that that is what's going to help drive the whole world to be able to get to zero. But fundamentally right now, we need to reinvent how we build buildings, how we fly planes, how we build cars and not just how we drive cars, how we drive across whole continents. And we don't have those tools yet, at least not cheap enough in order for us to be able to deploy them to the 80% of the world that doesn't live in, uh, in rich countries. And the only way that we're able to do that is to make sure that those countries are able to invent these technologies, are able to deploy these technologies, have the knowledge and resources that they, that they need in order to make sure that the te technologies are deployed in ways that make sense for their geography. So we were, we were all in from the beginning, and, and so uh, we're so grateful to be a partner. Uh, one of the things on the technology side that, and I will be very quick, is um, five years ago when we started, or six years ago now, when we started Breakthrough Energy, we started it because, uh, we started because the COP was not focusing enough on innovation. And one of the most hopeful things that I bring away from this COP is that innovation is now a centerpiece, that you have the private sector deeply ready to start financing these things, and programs like the Net Zero World program is going to help accelerate that in ways that uh, we're, we're really excited about. So we're really excited to partner. We're excited to partner with all of our uh, partners on the stage and also, of course, with the national labs and with all of the, um, our partner governments and countries uh, around the world. So thank you very much. Is there an opportunity we're missing? Oh, there's so many opportunities Just we're missing. One. one. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel. There's all tons right, of sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel. fuel. There we go. We're going to work on that too. Um, all right, Andrew Steer, who is the president of uh, Bezos Earth Fund. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Thank you, Secretary Granholm. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. This thank is uh, this has been um, something we've needed for a long time. 
The 17 U.S. national labs have been an incredible national treasure. They're now going to become an international asset that's going to make a huge difference. Ministers here, thank you for what you're doing, for the vision. Um, there is no reason why we shouldn't make this the decisive decade on energy, but we're currently not heading towards doing it. You say, what are we missing? We're missing a recognition that it's a jigsaw puzzle, it's not a silver bullet. What we're missing is the way to work together. I've been working in international energy now for more than 30 years. I've seen brilliant sparks of light. I've been part of some of them. But what we are not doing today is bringing all the pieces together. This will fail, and I know it won't fail, if this is simply a one-shot thing and we ignore all the other great things that are going on in the multilateral development banks, the DFCs, the private sector, the think tanks, the research. What this is going to do is bring it all together. And it's going to be absolutely brilliant because what we're missing today are plans that are really implementable. Most countries do not have deep decarbonization plans and includes a lot of rich countries too, by the way. Most countries do not have coherent policies or investment strategies. Most countries do not have seriously thought through project and program investment programs, and most countries do not have the financial resources that are required. And at the Bezos Earth Fund, yesterday we committed $3 billion to nature, and we want to play a role in energy too. And we are, uh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> we want to play a helpful role in this as well. You know, Victor Hugo, the great French philosopher, he said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we now have a great idea. The time has come, but we've got to work together. Raj Shah is going to come up here, I hope, and talk about the Global Energy Alliance, which we launched yesterday. And it's going to be a wonderful partner, an integrated partner uh, with this program you have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Raj, that's a perfect introduction. Raj is president of the Rockefeller Foundation, but now has a new initiative, and I'll let you describe. Uh, well, thank you, Secretary Granholm. I, I will say uh, it's great to be in Scotland with you since we're both Michiganders, and, and the secretary prior to this in her past was my governor. Uh, I, so I, I do have the task of introducing the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And it is basically a collaboration with philanthropy, with countries, with multilateral development banks. We announced a $10 billion platform yesterday to help accelerate the transition to renewable electrification. And importantly, in accelerating that transition in lower income countries, doing so in a manner that lifts up people who have been left behind. There are 3.6 billion people on this planet who consume less than 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy per capita per year. That compares to 8,000 in OECD countries and 12 in the United States. So you, you cannot have this grand transition, this grand transformation of the global economy take place if it doesn't capture the hopes and opportunities and aspirations of billions of people around the planet. And, and that's what we're going to be focused on doing together. And that uh, collaboration is one that we can commit will absolutely work with net zero world to help ensure that both efforts work together and are successful Yeah, because you can't fund uh, a, a country that doesn't have a plan that's right you need a plan right? right a plan is critical to making it happen yeah. thank you so thank you. much for joining us all right Mark Benioff um, is the founder and CEO of this little company called Salesforce, but I think he's here wearing a philanthropic you, hat today. So yep. thank you for your support of this. Well, thank you so much, Secretary, for having me. And I also want to thank Dr. Heller. I also want to thank Ron Benioff for bringing me in. And I want to thank the ministers for being here. And I'll tell you, there's three things that I'm excited about here at COP. Number one is exactly what we're here for, Net Zero World. I'm very proud that Salesforce, my company, is Net Zero today and hey. fully renewable. And as a Fortune 100 company with 75,000 employees, one of the fastest growing companies in the world, we want to be an example, a role model, that we can all be net zero right now, and here's how we can do it. Two, we announced this week our time tree fund, a $300 million fund for reforestation and sequestration, which is aligned with the 1T.org program that we announced 
approximately 18 months ago, and I especially want to thank President Biden yesterday for becoming our largest funder at $9 billion of reforestation in the United States. One trillion trees will sequester 200 gigatons of carbon. We badly need biodiversity and reforestation on our planet, and I'm very grateful for the President for his investment in joining 1T.org. And three, we need ecopreneurship, exactly like you're saying. We need great new ecopreneurs. I'm a technology entrepreneur. We want entrepreneurs, but who are vested in the ecology of the world. I'm so excited about so many of the American ecopreneurs that I'm seeing here at this conference. We have Will Marshall here, the CEO of Planet Labs, based in San Francisco, putting up low-hanging satellites that are measuring and monitoring and making transparent the carbon as well as the methane that's on the planet. We need that transparency to know where to operate and where to act. Two, we have another great entrepreneur here, Zach Parisa, the CEO of NCX Corporation, who is using biometricians and, and quantifying the amount of carbon that's held inside forests and then convincing landowners, don't cut down your trees. Instead, turn them into carbon credits and sequester and give us the ability to get to net zero. And three, we have another great entrepreneur here, which is the ability for all of us to be an ecopreneur. We can all decide that we're gonna take our businesses and dedicate them to become what we need to become net zero. So thank you so much, Secretary, for doing this, and thank you to all of you for being here, and I couldn't be more excited about creating a net zero great. world. Thank great, you. Great, great, thank you so much. So exciting to have uh, such vision represented up here. And, and I would say that, you know, without the financing, none of this happens. And on the government side, we have um, the DFC represented by Jake Levine, who is here. So he's the our money guy, one of our money guys. Um, and I want you, Jake, to say a word about what um, the Development Finance Corporation is thinking about with respect to this net zero world. Thank you so much, Secretary, and um, it, it, it really is like a silent disco, um, <laughs> so it's great to be here. I, I appreciate the chance to, to share a little bit um, from the DFC perspective. I just also want to say thank you to DOE uh, for this tremendous work, for the opportunity to participate, to the partner countries. Uh, you've done tremendous work this week. This, in addition to the Global Methane Pledge, incredible work. Um, and to our partners here, also, Secretary, I know you are an adopted Californian. Um, and Mark, also I just want to say thank you for all of your work in California with the California Climate Corps and supporting nature-based solutions there. I have three answers to your question. Right. I'll go very quickly. Number one, partnerships. We have not done enough in the DFI and MDB community to partner together. We need to work on standardizing our, our uh, uh, methods of investment so we can partner together. We need to work on uh, breaking down barriers of competition. And we need to work with philanthropists. And I just want to highlight one bright spot where we have recently partnered with the Rockefeller Foundation. They put in $50 million that in partnership with DFC has mobilized a billion dollars worth of applications in the distributed renewable energy sector. And we are now evaluating 16 applications that are worth about $215 million of uh, bankable projects in distributed renewable energy. We wouldn't have been able to unlock that without the partnership of Rockefeller and its catalytic capital. Number two, for too long we've thought of climate as synonymous with renewable energy. But it's a much broader world, and I appreciated NREL's comments on that. We're talking about industry, we're talking about transportation, buildings, nature-based solutions, and just in the way that DFC has been able to support in the times of this pandemic, uh, support for not just vaccine production, but the supply chains to create over a billion vaccines. We are very excited to support supply chains for clean energy across the spectrum. And finally, and I'm getting the wave, so I will wrap up. Uh, I just want to say that sometimes we need to apply the right financial tools to the right market. I learned today from a colleague at a regional development bank that all of these billions in pledges are great but they're being pledged in the wrong currency. And so that's why DFC comes in to play, to provide local currency, uh, to provide technical assistance, to provide the type of concessional finance that we need to unlock equity and debt at scale. Great. So thank you so much, Secretary. Great. All right, all right. 
So I'm going to ask um, these great panelists to step down. They're going to wipe the whatever they do. Uh, and while they do that, um, I think we're going to watch a brief video. And then after that video, I'll ask our partner com com countries to join us up here. All right. My name is Gillian Caldwell, and I'm USAID's new climate change coordinator. We are honored to be partnering with governments around the world, as well as many other U.S. government agencies like the Department of Energy Labs, in supporting the new Net Zero World Initiative. Our researchers are leveraging some of the world's most powerful scientific tools to develop and deploy the materials and technology solutions necessary to decarbonize global energy systems. The scientists and engineers at Berkeley Lab are working every day to find solutions that will accelerate the decarbonization of the entire economy. Argonne is eager to bring its deep research expertise, unique scientific tools and facilities, and world-class community of talent to bear in collaboration with our Net Zero World partners. My lab is committed to understanding what it will really take to get to Net Zero. I'm excited to offer Enroth expertise in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy systems integration research. PNNL is eager to collaborate with our international partners by sharing our capabilities in climate change impact assessment, smart building technologies, energy storage solutions, and decades of experience in international technology deployments. USTDA has committed $60 million in 2023 to help countries mobilize investment for the transition to a cleaner economy to address the climate crisis we all face. This assistance, delivered in concert with the Department of Energy and the U.S. private sector, will increase access to innovative technologies that expand our shared prosperity. ORNL supports the Net Zero World Initiative. Berkeley Lab supports the Net Zero World Initiative. Argonne supports the Net Zero World Initiative. LLNL supports the Net Zero World Initiative. NREL supports the Net Zero World Initiative. The Northwest National Laboratory supports the Net Zero World Initiative. The U.S. government looks forward to partnering with you on our collective journey toward a net zero world. Well, I have to start by saying that uh, I'm very honored and I have to thank uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, administration and the DOE and, of course, your honorable uh, uh, secretary, Jennifer. Thank you very much for inviting us and for having this important initiative, uh, the Net Zero Initiative, where uh, we are uh, uh, attending the launch of this important initiative. For us in Egypt, of course, I have to say that uh, we are definitely uh, committed to uh, uh, combat the, uh, uh, the climate change and uh, we are very much aligned with uh, COP21 and here we are actually in our uh, uh, endeavors to uh, host as we are a nominated country to host the COP27 next year. So definitely 
uh, we are very much interested uh, for a successful COP26 in order to make sure that it lands well uh, in Egypt next year. I have to say that uh, Egypt started uh, years ago uh, with the important uh, to recognize the importance of uh, uh, low carbon emissions and uh, we have through our strategy that we have uh, 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 selected uh, uh, in 2016 chosen uh, the transition fuel which was the natural gas as a transition fuel uh, with low carbon emissions and since then we have been able to successfully do uh, a, a good uh, uh, transition and uh, we have been able to use and to transit our, hundred, our hydrocarbons from a percentage I would say that now we have like 65% of our hydrocarbons is depending on natural gas. We have been able also to connect 12.5 million households to natural gas. We switched more than 400 uh, vehicles to uh, operate with CNG, as well as 90% of our power, uh, electric power plants are gas-fired now. We have 10% uh, uh, running on renewables with an aim to reach uh, 35 by year 2035, uh, 42% of renewables. So these are uh, very important uh, uh, ambition plan and uh, we are really committed to that. Uh, if I go directly to where we think that uh, we are in somehow in challenge, I would say that definitely, uh, but the results and the answer was here in this initiative. Actually, it is the access to necessary funds. Uh, uh, this is a very em empirical as well as the uh, application of technology. And uh, these two uh, main factors, I would say that with what I've seen in the presentation uh, uh, at the beginning, where we have here a clear uh, roadmap with uh, clear milestones, year 22, year 23, year 24 and 25, we have uh, set targets uh, and there are definite uh, different uh, agencies and departments and the laboratories that will help us to avail the funds, to avail the technology. This will help us to transit quickly uh, and fast to uh, low carbon fuels. Actually, uh, for us, I would say that the most important uh, components that we would like and we are uh, seeking is uh, uh, the, uh, the CC US, and this is something very important, and, and the United States is very advanced in that, that could help us a lot, as well as uh, uh, biofuels, and this is an important part uh, that we would see uh, uh, that uh, we need. And uh, I think that uh, with the help of uh, the funds and the source of technology that you will be uh, 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 funding and availing through technology as well as with what we are currently doing uh, is uh, developing a strategy for uh, hydrogen. And now we have, of course, to reach, you know, Egypt's uh, position is very well uh, uh, adapted for uh, or equipped for uh, renewables, uh, whether wind or solar. So uh, aiming to reach uh, a green hydrogen perhaps in the coming decade. But until then, we are working for uh, blue hydrogen. Therefore, these are the three important uh, uh, initiatives or priorities for us that would seek uh, the help of the US as well as uh, either for funds or for technology. Our goal, of course, is to really bring down the cost of clean hydrogen. Yes. And uh, we know that hydrogen, many have seen as a clean dispatchable baseload fuel. Um, we know how important that is, and we know it's very important as well to make renewables as um, baseload-like as possible exactly. through the store ability to storage, whether that is with hydrogen or with batteries, et cetera. So you're primed to be able to lead in that, and we're Thank excited you. to be able to help you. That's great. Thank you. Yes, um, let's turn now to Minister Tasrif, who is uh, from Indonesia. Curious, same question for you. Biggest opportunity and technology that you think would be most beneficial for Indonesia Thank to you. reach that clean Thank energy you, future? Thank you, Secretary Granholm. That Indonesia, we are uh, blessed with the resources of the energy. Uh, you name it, we have uh, solar energy, we have uh, wind, geothermal, hydro, and bio 
bioenergy also, yeah, and then also we identify, we also have the potential of uh, undercurrent and tidal, tidal uh, energy potential. So uh, those energy we are going to utilize to replace our carbon based energy during the transition. Our challenge is, is that the, the location of the energy, the renewable energy source is spreading. Our country is archipelagic country. So we have to be, we have to be equipped yeah, with, with the infrastructure. So we have to build transmission infrastructure in order to accommodate all kinds of sources into our system. So the big opportunity is that uh, from the COP26 that uh, right now we are here, that we feel, we feel the sentiments yeah, of the togetherness of all country to face, to combat the climate change. Every country will help each other yeah, to, in order to, to achieve the goal itself. And regarding the technology, yeah, we, we thought that uh, recently to accelerate, to accelerate the renewable come into our system, we, we think the solar, solar will be more, most favorable. Yeah, uh, we plan in our uh, national energy strategy, we plan that solar will be, we, we, we will use. And then, of course, uh, we think about hydrogen. Yeah, we have uh, potential of uh, wind, wind energy, and also hydro. If we build it in the big scale, it will create such kinds of uh, competitive costs. And then we can, can we can generate the hydrogen to to be the to be the material to make a clean. Clean, uh, clean emission. Yeah. Uh, well, we have the, what we have to do is that now we need partnership to support us. We will prepare such kind of regulation in order to make the investment is more attractive, and then also win-win uh, solution. Very great. Very great. I know that um, Dr. Keller is taking notes. You've obviously got uh, a silver buckshot, as we say, not a silver bullet, but a silver buckshot solution with so many options, including geothermal, which I love. Um, all right. Uh, Minister Haloshenko from Ukraine, same uh, question for you is, what do you see as the biggest opportunity uh, for Ukraine to get to the goals of the net zero and the technology, perhaps, that you think would be most beneficial? First of all, thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. In fact, that, that is uh, really great opportunities, net zero world. And of course, we support fully this initiative. Uh, and that is even, today I see that this, this is even more than opportunities because we have a concrete partners. So it means that there's open a door for concrete actions. And uh, I see the terms. So it's really the actions uh, today and tomorrow. And that is very important because Ukraine, of course, we have very ambitious plan. We already um, take the obligation to reduce CO2 emission by uh, 2030 by 65 percent. And this is quite ambitious plan, but we know that it's achievable. What is important for this, we, of course, need to face out coal. And today the thermal gener generation in Ukraine is about 30 percent. It means that we should substitute this by by another generation. So we have already, of course, we, we have nuclear, which is the basic generation in Ukraine. We have 15 uh, uh, nuclear units, which produce more than 56% of all electricity of the country. And having this nuclear, of course, we want to, uh, to increase uh, the, the level of nuclear. We want to build new units. We have very great potential for cooperation with Westinghouse and you know we already signed some documents. Of course that is very important. From the other hand we see that we need to increase renewables because today it's, 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 it's not the level which we want and we, had, we have the strategy to increase by 25 percent. What, what we need in that case? Of course we need 
offshore wind. We need uh, solar. Uh, we need storages. Uh, speaking about nuclear, of course, we we want to participate in SMR programs, which is where we have very good grounds to do. We have very high qualified uh, pers personnel who already uh, involved in nuclear uh, nuclear industry. We in Ukraine we have around. 400,000 people who involved in, in nuclear. So and we have very good facilities. And of course, that is very important. And, and one of the, probably the goal which we have, one of the most important goals, that we want to do all this transformation of energy system to become a part of European <coughs> energy system. We want to go through synchronization, to synchronize with Europe. And doing this, we could really uh, work together with Europe to be a more safe energy system and to be decarbonized. So very exciting. Another type of clean energy, of course, uh, depending on where people sit and what is acceptable. So excited to be able to partner with you on this, Minister Haloshenko. Um, Minister Silva, so glad to welcome you as well from Nigeria. Same question to you. What do you see as an opportunity? What technologies do you think will be most beneficial? Can hear, you can't hear. If it, now you can hear. Okay. Go. Okay. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Secretary, um, and uh, Net Zero World Initiative for inviting me here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, especially uh, just a day after my president uh, declared his commitment to Net Zero uh, 2060. Uh, this is just to tell you that Nigeria is fully committed to net zero. We have already started in my ministry by trying to bring down the gas flares, which for us is our biggest contributor to carbon emission. Uh, we've been able to bring it down to 8%. And uh, by end of this year, hopefully, when we complete our gas flare commercialization program, we'll be able to bring it to zero. But on a lighter note, uh, we always say in Nigeria, that on a per capita basis, we are already at the point that you're aspiring to, even below the point you're aspiring to in 2040, 2030. We actually emit much less. We are not really the big problem in the emission, emission equation. But of course, we don't want to freeze our growth here. If we freeze our growth here, then we don't have to be part of this conversation because we've already achieved net zero, I mean, uh, your target. We're already there. But that means that we need, we have a very huge headroom for growth. We don't want to grow in the wrong direction. And that's why we want to partner with you to ensure that the headroom for growth goes in the right direction. Uh, so what we need in Nigeria is uh, three things, partnership, finance, and technology. And these are the things we'll package and we'll come to you very soon in the US uh, Secretary to discuss this. Um, one of the technologies we are particularly interested in, however, is the carbon capture and sequestration technology. We believe that there is still a lot of hope in that. Because like somebody said here, it is not just about renewable, but it's about clean energy for the future. So if there is any way we can clean the energy that already exists, I mean, we have uh, our pathway, uh, we have chosen a pathway uh, through gas, just like uh, my colleague from Egypt said. We have decided to choose gas as our transition fuel. We know it is not the cleanest form of energy, but we believe that if we work with you uh, to, in the development of this technology, deepening this uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology, we'll be able to clean this uh, source of energy for the future. And that's really what one way we want, one area we want to partner with you. So we will come to you 
to seek for partnership, to seek for finance, and to seek for the technology very soon. Thank you very much. Very great, very great. Thank you so much. And as you all um, partner with us, I know everybody will keep an open mind about all kinds of technologies that are that are clean to add to what you are already working on. So that's part of our, our goal is to share with you what the paths are. Maybe it might be able to accelerate some of your own commitments when you see how doable it is. And maybe um, some of you might be able to be uh, exporting that clean technology elsewhere as well, because you do have head, headroom for growth, right? Although you're a very tall man. Um, but, <laughs> but I want to thank you all. Please, would you please thank our partner countries, our ministers for their, for their words. Thank you all for coming. We are very excited about Net Zero World, and um, we look forward to future announcements at COP26 uh, with other uh, Te both to on technology as well as other projects that the Department of Energy is working on in concert with the U.S. government. Thank you all.